Thanks for taking the time to download this BBC Radio 5 Live podcast. To find other programmes you might be interested in, click bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live, where you'll also find our terms of use. Good morning, it's Thursday morning, June 21st. This is Wake Up To Money with Mickey Clark and Andy Verity on BBC Radio 5 Live and Radio Ulster. Coming up in the next half hour... I'm hoping doctors will think again, reconsider this, uh, and not engage in strike action. I hope the BMA, even at this late stage, will call it off, because it will achieve nothing. The Health Secretary, Andrew Lansley, says today's 24-hour industrial action by doctors is pointless. The doctors want a second opinion. We'll get an independent view of what it is in the changes to their pensions they're resisting and assess their case. Spain will publish an audit of its banks this afternoon ahead of the meeting of Eurozone finance ministers in Luxembourg. Will those audits confirm the estimated 100 billion euro black hole in the bank's finances or paint an even bleaker picture? And a group of bankers has written to G20 governments urging them to adopt the financial transaction tax. We'll ask one of the bankers why he backs the idea. University researchers say the collapse of Royal Bank of Scotland was the result of economic violence. We'll find out what they mean. What do you think it means? We'd be interested in your views on the text. What does economic violence mean? What do you think it is? Also, we'd like to hear what you think about the doctors striking over changes to their pensions. Text us on 85058 or you can tweet us Andy, at Andy Verity or at BBC Five Live. You're listening to Wake Up To Money, a podcast from BBC Radio Five Live. For more information, go online. bbc.co.uk slash five live. Doctors across the UK are taking industrial action today for the first time in nearly 40 years. Medics will still provide emergency treatment, but for 24 hours they're boycotting non-urgent care in protest over changes to their pensions. These include increasing their retirement age in line with the state pension age, Moving from a final salary to a career average pension, we'll explain what that means, and higher member contributions. Here's the Deputy Chair of the British Medical Association, Dr Richard Vautry, explaining why some members of the union are taking this action. Uh, We've been pushed into this by the government, who's torn up a fair and sustainable and affordable agreement on NHS pensions that was only reached four years ago um, and would have been sustainable for the future and is sustainable for the future. The big thing about that particular deal was that if there were increased pressures, if doctors lived longer or other healthcare professionals lived longer, that extra cost would have been borne by the doctors and nurses and others within the health service, not by the taxpayer. There was no need to rip up that deal that was sustainable and fair. What we're left with is a very unfair deal, um, and that's why doctors are so angry. It won't surprise you to hear that the Health Secretary, Andrew Lansley, disagrees with that view. Here's what he told Five Live yesterday. I'm hoping doctors will think again, reconsider this, uh, and not engage in strike action. I hope the BMA, even at this late stage, will call it off, because it will achieve nothing. Uh, It will only have the effect of damaging the services provided to patients and risking patients' care. There are many trade unions, it's an NHS pension scheme, not a doctor's pension scheme, and there are many NHS trade unions, midwives, uh, nurses, unison and others, who they may not have liked it, but they have accepted that we're now going to go ahead and implement this deal. I'm not going to change the scheme because the um, BMA threatens industrial action. So, who's right? Let's get an independent view from John Wright, who's Head of Public Sector Pensions at the financial consultants Hyman's Robertson. Good morning, John. Good morning. Let's spell out some of these changes so that we understand what the terms of debate are in this industrial action. First of all, just back to basics for us, if you would. The difference between a final salary scheme and a career average scheme. In a final salary scheme, the pension you get is based on your salary at the date that you retire. And under a career average system, um, what happens is that you earn a bit of pension every year based on the salary you're earning that year. But then what happens is it gets revalued to retirement. You get interest added to it up to the date of retirement. In fact, a career average scheme and a final salary scheme could deliver exactly the same pension on average for someone whose earnings go up in line with average earnings. What's happened in the past with final salary schemes is they tend to favour Um, those whose pay goes up most rapidly over their career. Yes, because if you think about one scenario, you might be trundling along on, say, 30 grand for 20 years, and then close to retirement, you suddenly get promoted and you've got 60 grand. Suddenly, all your previous year's contributions have doubled their money effectively, haven't they? Because they're contributing to a much higher final salary. That's exactly right. Under the final salary scheme, you could have been paying your contributions on a low salary, 
and then towards the end of your career you get a much uh, you get a pension based on a much bigger amount of salary so the career average system should be fair it's really poorly understood people think that it, it means that it's based on your average salary over your career and therefore you know your average salary is less than your final salary and therefore it must be worse the really important point is that career average is a revalued earning scheme yes and you get interest added Yes, and, 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 through your career. and what's always been unfair about final salary schemes is that if you have a steep earnings curve and your earnings go up really sharply, then you get much more out of it pound for pound, don't you, than someone who's, whose career trundles along. Yeah, the, the, at a final salary scheme, it tends to um, favour uh, disproportionately those whose um, who's your high the earnings, flyers. Uh, yeah, the high flyers, those whose earnings increase, especially towards the end okay. of their career. I mean, having spelled that out, the civil service, for example, did accept a shift from final salary to career average, didn't they? Because it was explained to them and they believed that it was fair. Do you believe that the doctors are correct in saying that we don't think the way this has been done is fair? I, I think that a career average scheme um, tends to... You, the people, there are always winners and losers out these things, and... Um, and so, um, you know, the people who tend to do a bit better out of a career average scheme might be those with um, career breaks, broken service, um, often, often women, of course. And, um, and, and the argument is that career average scheme is fairer um, across the whole of the workforce. And, and, and you're quite right, the civil servants, uh, for, for people who joined um, uh, starting a few years ago, they're in a career average scheme already, and the other schemes are all moving towards career average. In fact, as, as far as I understand, I think GPs are already in a career average scheme, and it'll be uh, nurses and doctors and other NHS staff who are moving from final salary now to career average, which um, should be fairer in general. We heard from the BMA that the the, the current system is sustainable, but is it? Um, you know, if I want a four thousand pound a year pension, I've got to have a hundred thousand pounds in the pot. The, <laughs> Sounds like it's a very difficult question, that one. <laughs> <laughs> as always, yeah, is it sustainable? It, it, the, as you know, the reason that these reforms have been uh, put in place is because people are living much longer. Every decade, people are living about two and a half years longer on average. Now, when these schemes, uh, the current schemes were originally designed, um, you know, it might have been expected that people would receive that pension um, you know, for, for maybe 15 years or so. And now people are receiving their pensions for 20 years or more. So something has to give a combination of people paying more into their pension and retiring later. But the doctors say that they'd already taken into account that when they did their last assessment. And it's a similar yeah. argument to what you hear from the public servants who say, well, look, the government actually did an assessment. We've already accepted higher contributions and, and smaller benefits. It should be sustainable on that basis. We don't need another change. This is us paying for the government's mistakes and for the financial crisis. Well, the, the truth is that peop the, the rate of uh, improvement in life expectancy conti you know, continues um, you know, life expense continues to improve. One of the things that was intended uh, to happen under the previous deal, and there were deals between about 2005 and 2008 for the various public sector schemes, was a complicated system called cap and share. And the idea was that if costs increased, um, then what would happen is that there would be um, changes that agreed to contributions and to retirement age and to benefits. In other words, you'd share out the increased cost. Yes, that's exactly right. So, so the current pensions as they stand today, um, those may have changed anyway. It may well have had a combination of higher contributions and later retirement and, and changes to benefits. The trouble with that system was it was never uh, fully put into place. It was extremely complicated. Um, there, could, there was a potential for arguments about the assumptions in which it was based sure. and, and so on. And actually, the system that's proposed now, with where the main cost control is going to be through an automatic link to state pension age, and that's going to help control the main um, uh, cost pressure, which is people living longer. OK, very so briefly, though, yeah. for, for an overall assessment, and in a word, do you think that the... Uh, are your sympathies with the doctors or with the government? Well, it's not just for me to say who my sympathies are with, but okay. what I can say is that um, even with the, you know, first of all, people within 10 years of retirement won't see a penny change to their pensions. In fact, as a best off system, you can actually do better out of it. And what I can say is that even if you do, first of all, the, your, your, your pet, those who are close to retirement won't see a penny change within 10 okay. years, look the same. And even those who have the new scheme for their whole career 
we'll still probably get a pension about two thirds of pay or, or more John with Wright. a government guarantee. And I think most people are very happy with that. Thank you very much. John Wright there from Hyman's Robertson. Today is a key day for Spain. This afternoon, following a €2 billion Euro bond auction, an all-important audit of the country's banks will be published. Armed with that information, Spain's finance minister is then expected to make a formal request for the billions of euros its banks need to stay afloat. He'll do that at the meeting of Eurozone finance ministers in Luxembourg, effectively rubber-stamping the deal struck earlier this month. Santiago, Santiago Cabo Barberi is Professor of Economics at the University of Granada. Uh, Santiago, what are we expecting from the bank's audits? What are they going to tell us? Uh, good morning. Uh, well, we don't know. Uh, I think it will probably the, the results will be in line with those of the IMF report. Uh, probably for those that don't remember, uh, the IMF report uh, that was published uh, around two weeks ago uh, it said that the Spanish banks needed around 40 billion uh, in, in new capital. And probably the, I mean, what the consensus or what the analysts say now is that could be a little higher in those in these two audits. Which well, we've we've got a like figure 50, of 60 million. we've got a figure of 100 50, billion. 60, yeah. yeah, I mean it's more well, than but, doubled in the space of a few weeks. No, uh, well, yes, but that, that includes the buffer. I, I think uh, uh, what when the IMF announced 40 billion, uh, it was kind of the lower bound of the of the range of the possible capital needed. Probably the the actual figure will be higher, but uh, the, the 100 billion, as far as we know now, it includes the buffer. I mean, a kind of a margin, I mean, so a leeway you, you have to increase uh, just in case things get worse in, in the Spanish economy. Santiago, in spite of these plans being on the books and everybody knowing, knowing they're going to go ahead, we've had these worries on the bond markets about Spanish borrowing. Yeah. Um, the rates been coming down a little bit from its peak but it's still at unmanageable levels why do you think that is uh, well I, I think the the lack of confidence in the in the spanish economy uh, i think there has been too much uncertainty about about banking about the spanish banks and now uh, that has to be finished otherwise the situation i mean will get out of control and over the last few days we've had a few declarations from european policy makers leaders saying that uh, there could be possibilities to buy bonds by, by the European facility, no? European uh, financial stability uh, facility. No? OK, and that, but, will have brought uh, the, that will have brought the rates down, wouldn't it? But there is this problem yeah. that the, 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 when we had the declaration about this extra, all this money going to the banks, it, it's going via the government and it's going through the yeah. government's books. Now, do you think that that's a sensible arrangement? Well, uh, as... With regard to the present, to, to, with, with, with regard to the current arrangements that uh, you, the European Union has, is the only possibility. I mean, the the government has to warranty some, some, somehow uh, any money that is coming into the Spanish economy, no matter what the final destination is, whether it's the banks or not. Of course, in, the, in a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, topical uh, uh, European Union, uh, it would be great if, if the money. Uh, could go uh, directly uh, or went directly to the to the banks, but uh, w with the pr current arrangement we have, it's going to be very very difficult. It have to go through some a Spanish government agency that sort of underwrites the that money. Okay, thank you, Santiago Roberti there from the University of Granada. Have we got time to do the markets? I suspect so. Um, George Godwer from uh, Matley Asset Management is our markets guest this morning. Morning, George. Good morning. Let's rattle through the numbers first off. FTSE, that finished up 36 at 5,622 in Germany. The DAX, that was up 29 at 6,392. And in Paris, the CAC Curon was up 8.5 at 3,126. Back in the trend in New York was the Dow, which finished down 13 at 12,824. Some uh, some doubts now about the U.S. economy. The U.S. Federal Reserve has cut its growth forecast and extended what it calls the twist operation, which is basically selling short-term bonds to buy longer bonds and bring down the cost of borrowing. Is that right? Yes, it is. So, the, so what they're trying to do is they keep down long-term interest rates to hopefully it's cheaper for mortgage owners and companies to borrow. But clearly, as we've seen with sort of QE in the U.K., that also does hit you know, pensioners and those that rely on the long bond yield for s sort of full savings. OK, George, we'll leave it there. This is a download from the BBC. To download other programmes or for more information, go online. bbc.co.uk slash five live. We have some text 
that have come in, Mickey, on, on pensions. Michael from Washington says, uh, pension cuts are not fair just because someone else gets less. Please spell out MPs' pensions and why they're setting an example as we're all supposed to be in it together. He yeah, says. Chris, Chris in Cambridge says there's no mention of how much the employer, i.e. the taxpayer, contrib- contributes to the doctor's pension. What is it? 14%, I think. Mine is nil. The doctors, They're not doing too bad. Yeah, another similar one. The doctor's pension is the stuff of dreams for the taxpaying public who pay for it. They should get back to work and stop bleating, says Rob. But May in the West Midlands says the doctors are right to strike as this government has broken its agreement concerning their pension. It's not wise to cross a doctor, she says. More texts if you want to send them to us. 85058 is the number, of course. Now, here's something you might not expect to hear. More than 50 senior figures in the financial services industry have written a letter to David Cameron and the rest of the leaders of the G20 calling for the introduction of a financial transaction tax. The Prime Minister's promised to veto any move within the European Union to introduce the so-called Robin Hood tax. He says it's a bad idea that will have a negative effect on the economy. Wallace Turberville is a senior fellow at the US think tank Demos and a former vice president at Goldman Sachs. He's also one of the signatories of the letter and joins us live from New York. Thanks for staying up for us, Wallace. Oh, uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Happy to do so. Let's just clarify exactly what sort of a financial transaction tax you're talking about and how it would work. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the obviously there are several versions around. Um, the one um, in the U.S., uh, that's been proposed by uh, Congressman DeFazio and Senator Harkin is a finan- uh, across the board financial transaction tax on uh, uh, stocks, bonds, and derivatives of uh, three basis points. Um, three basis so points, a, so 0. 0.03 of a percent. That's correct. So it's a, it's a, it's re- it's relatively low to the uh, uh, transaction tax that's being been proposed in Europe, which is. Um, which is is more than three times that for uh, stocks and bonds, but but less for derivatives. So it's a a, a, a flat out tax on each transaction. And what's your argument for it, and why are you arguing for it as from a bank, from a banker's point of view? Uh, well, there are two two reasons. Uh, first, obviously, it uh, uh, raises revenue for the government. So that um, there have been various uh, estimates of how much it might raise. Uh, in the uh, U.S., the uh, thought is that that it could raise as as much as 175 uh, billion a year in revenue, uh, and uh, uh, different uh, calculations uh, for the European version. Uh, well, well, if that's the, right, if that's right, it would sort out a lot of of the U.S. debt problem, wouldn't it? But the the argument that yeah, we the argument that we hear against it in the U.K. and part of the reason our own prime minister has been opposed is because they're convinced by arguments that say if you impose this, the money and the bankers will just go elsewhere. Uh, well, I think it's uh, important to understand the uh, relative size of this. Um, the 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 typical equity fund in the United States uh, charges customers something like 140 basis points annually, um, and uh, 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 for an equity fund and a bond fund is uh, 92 basis points. So there are there are pl- plenty of uh, uh, fees and expenses associated with transactions already. And this particular uh, one would be uh, quite small. But everyone so, has to do it. Is that right? I mean, that's the weakness of your argument. If only, if only a few do it, then it's going to weaken the argument. Everybody's got to do it. And what's the likelihood of that? Uh, it's certainly the argument. Uh, I don't believe it because of the, uh, again, the relative size of it. In there. And, and transaction expenses uh, would not be materially higher uh, if the transaction tax were opposed at the, imposed at the levels that have been discussed. I see. It's a sort so of mass that's, argument that's, here. Yeah. You're, saying, you're saying when you're paying 1.5% or 2% to the fund managers anyway, what difference does 0.03% make? Uh, certainly. And there, there have been other marketing fees that have been proposed that are, that are uh, 10 times the size. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> I think that that's a specious argument. Okay. Uh, the other reason I particularly uh, uh, like it, and it's a, it's a reason that's given in opposition, is that it would uh, dampen uh, transaction activity, and I think that that would actually be a uh, a, um, a very positive development. Uh, okay. The kinds of transaction uh, activity that would it would uh, most uh, 
uh, effect would be the kinds of transactions that aren't useful to the economy. That, of course, the problem is like, okay. Uh, things thank like high-frequency trading. All right. Thank you very much for explaining that. Wallace Turbeville there, former vice president at Goldman Sachs. And talking of banks and, and problems with banks, the collapse of Royal Bank of Scotland was the result of economic violence, according to a report from the University of Leicester, into the reasons behind the failure of RBS in 2008. Sarah Robinson is one of the authors of the report. Would, would you be talking about the sort of uh, transactions that we were just hearing about there from Wallace when you talk about economic violence, Sarah? Hello, good morning. Uh, no, we see economic violence. We're using economic violence to describe an overly, uh, overly aggressive management style that it was at its height during the uh, early uh, 2000s as a way of leading, which was perceived as bullying and macho and under which staff lived um, in fear of redundancy and failing to achieve tar uh, difficult targets. Was there um, a significant difference between NatWest before RBS took it over and how the culture was after? Um, I don't... Not we, meant to be a trick question. Sorry, we, well, we've been studying um, um, the Royal Bank of Scotland at that time, and we found um, that... Um, there was um, there was a fear there was a fearful climate and um, prob problems of communication where people were afraid to give pos to okay. give uh, briefly, other than positive messages. Briefly, would you blame that that fearful climate on the leader of the bank at the time, Fred Goodwin? Um, what we've been looking at, we've taken a historical approach where we've looked at the um, the evolution of management and leadership over a 20-year period. Uh, we we've we found that um, the this episode um, of which. Um, you're Fred, saying it's not particularly him. It's a it's a matter of culture, are you? Is that uh, the general it, it was idea? a matter of culture within the bank? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sarah okay. Robertson, there from the uh, University much. of Leicester. Would you go along with that, George Godber? Well, I think there was there was a culture of fear and divide and rule under. under Did you Fred have Goodwin. too much testosterone, George? Well, <laughs> certainly not at five thirty in the morning. I can imagine. While we got here, let's have a look at the papers and the Guardian reveals the case against the bosses of Fairpack has collapsed. Uh, it's taken long enough, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, and I'd probably sort of, you know, no real comfort for those, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who did lose their, their hard-earned savings in, in, you know, when you don't get this segregation of client assets. By that, I mean that when you're putting money into these schemes, you know, is the money being safe and segregated? And that clearly was the issue at Fairpack. And yeah. what about the story in the Financial Times, George, saying we shouldn't worry about a Grexit, as, as they call it, in that unpleasant word, or we should be talking about a chin-down, instead China problems? Yeah, I, did, um, I, don't, I don't know who comes up with these phrases or whether it's just the function of Twitter. Board, we, we've had them all this week, yeah. believe me. <laughs> um, but I, I think the point of the article is actually saying that you know, what, you, what Beijing is now trying to do is to, slow, is to move away from this 10% growth target and move away from sort of needless infrastructure. The way you boost GDP is by just building roads, train stations, even if they're not needed. And now they are trying to move to this consumerization of the economy. And that's what the article is looking for. And I think it's sort of quite interesting in terms of what it'll mean for commodity prices. The, uh, there's an item in The Guardian which says the Crown Estate is now worth more than £8 billion. I suppose we should explain exactly what the Crown Estate is and how it uh, so, varies from, was it the other one, the Crown Agents? Yeah, so with George III handed over the land when he ran out of money in return for an income, so actually we all own the Crown Estate, and, uh, and it is doing rather well, so at least that's one bit of good news for us taxpayers. Uh, and more tax avoidance in the Times. That yeah. should please a few people. <laughs> Will it be yours next, Andy? I don't know. <laughs> Mine all comes out at source, Mickey. I've got no choice about it. <laughs> Thanks a lot to George Godber there from Matterley Asset Management. Lots of text supporting the doctors, and we'll be hearing much more about the strike, the case for and against in the breakfast programme, which is just coming up. Chris Warburton on Five Live. Five Lives Wake Up to Money podcast. Delivered to your computer every weekday. For more information, go online. bbc.co.uk slash five live.